Um, we're continuing in our series, faith, uh, um, Living by Faith. And so today, we're looking at faith that pleases God. Uh, let's just recap on that reading that uh, Margie read to us. Uh, because I'm going to be using that reading as the backdrop to, to um, what the sermon is about. Um, the fig tree that Jesus comes to, now the fig tree would be, um, um, bears fruit twice in a year, one in season and one out of season. Um, uh, when there are leaves present, there is a very good chance that there would be fruit. Um, but in season, there will be an abundance of fruit. So Jesus comes up to this fig tree. Um, it is appearing that there would be the fruit, but not the in-season fruit, but there would be fruit. Um, but there's nothing. Scripture says he found nothing. Uh, so he curses the fig tree, which to the disciples is, but this is a little bit strange. Why is he cursing a fig tree for? Um, he then goes down to the, to the temple, to an area that would be known as the court of the Gentiles. It was a massive area. You could put, put several football fields into this area. Uh, the area what it was um, originally designed for was that as Israel was given this good news of God's covenant that he had made with Israel, they were to go out and tell all nations that they called the Gentiles. And they were now free to be able to come into this outer court called the court of the Gentiles and to come and worship there. It could take tens of thousands of people who could be there. But what does Jesus find? He doesn't find, find that the nation of Israel have gone out to go and tell people about God. What they've done instead is that they have occupied it with the busyness of a tiny little section of the temple, which is now all these money changers. And this whole area is filled with these money changers. And Jesus goes and turns these tables over. The disciples also look at this as strange. The next day, as they're walking along, they notice that this fig tree that Jesus has cursed is dead. And for them, this is, what is going on here? What, what's all this about? And Jesus responds simply with one phrase, have faith in God. And they look at this and they go, how does this connect? A fig tree, a fig tree, that would have residual fruit, going into a temple um, in the court of the Gentiles. How do these things even connect? And then Jesus says, have faith in God. What Jesus is talking about here is faith that pleases God. Let's, let's put this together and, and we'll then see the workings of it. The fig tree is often referred to as the nation of Israel. The nation had not borne fruit. What it had done is that it had become preoccupied with itself. It was now desiring to do things for itself only. It had become, if you could call it, double-minded. What its mind was supposed to do, what it was um, asked to go and do, was to go and tell the Gentile nations the good news about who God is. They had decided to go and do something completely different. They were in two minds. This was not faith that pleased God at all. And so this is a demonstration, if you could call it an enacted parable. Jesus was acting out to show them this is what it looks like when your mind doubts what God asks us to do, when you become double-minded. So let's look at the workings of this we're going to just quickly re, re, recap, um, um, and we go on to those kingdom principles. Remember that every week we can look at the kingdom principles. We're, we're then going to be looking at um, um, how this faith works and then, the, and, and then the challenge. But let's look at the kingdom principle behind us. If you could call it the law that operates behind us, such as um, a particular law would, would be that if you throw something up, it is going to come down. Um, um, my third son, Caleb, he does archery. Um, he, 
he will not allow me to fire an arrow straight into the air. Because he says, Dad, it will come down. And if any of you have seen that movie, Grown Ups, um, that is probably what would happen to one of us, or probably me. So um, that's a law. You know that there is going to be a cause and effect. Remember the scripture that comes from Hebrews. Now, um, if you want to follow in the notes, in um, the intimations, right in the middle, we've now put the notes so that you've got the basic outline. Um, but um, um, that doesn't mean to say that right at this point you can leave because you've now got the thing. There's, there's stuff that's explained in there. The kingdom pr uh, principle. This kingdom principle, it comes out of Hebrews uh, uh, chap chap chapter 1. Uh, sorry, chapter 11, um, um, it encapsulates what is being said here um, in chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Um, it says, the only way to please God is by growing in faith, in the tested evidence of his nature and work on the cross. We've been dealing with this for the last two, two weeks. The only way. You and I can please God. You and I cannot please God in any way. You and I cannot dance or, or do anything. You can't, there is nothing you and I can do that God will look at and say, I'm happy with that, apart from trusting Him, having faith in Him. That's all that He asks. He says, That's the only way that you're going to please Him. The only way to please God is by having faith in Him. But it's not just faith, it's a growing faith. It's a faith that must grow. And the faith that is based upon, not wishful thinking, not a jump into the darkness, not um, going, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to suck some, some, something up my thumb and believe that. No, it is based upon tested evidence. And the tested evidence is of his nature, who he is, and his work, and particularly his work that he's done on the cross and the resurrection. So now we look at the scripture. Um, Hebrews 11, chapters 1 and chapter 6. We don't look at the in-between parts. You can go and read those in-between parts. Jordan, if you can just flip the slide over at the next, next one. Um, here's what that scripture says. It says, now faith is, we dealt with this last week. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Verse 6 now says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. There you go. It's in black and white in Scripture. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, Jesus is saying to His disciples, when they stand and they're going, we don't understand this thing about this fig tree. We don't understand about what you did at the temple. And Jesus says, well, have faith. And they're going, well, what do you mean by faith? He says, well, if you have faith, you can literally say to this mountain, get up and move. And it will go. But the problem is, is that you doubt it. You're doubting the existence of God. That's why nothing's working for you. So let's start um, the kingdom principle. That is happening here. The kingdom principle that's going on here, that's going on behind the scenes, is that God has created human beings for faith. Created us, you and I, to have faith in God. You've got two, two scriptures that I've pulled out. There's several, but just two because we don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, it says, He has set eternity into the hearts of man, in, in, into the human heart. He's put it there. He's put eternity into our hearts. In Acts, Paul talking at the Areopagus, when he was debating against the Athenians, um, says, says to them, God, God, God did this, in other words, he showed himself to this world. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. God has made it evident that he is around. And, and, and what you do see 
in life is that human beings have this overwhelming yearning for something that is bigger and greater than, them, than themselves. It's within them. They want to know, is there something bigger and greater than me? And what is it? And so what humans go and do is, is that they go and start to think up some kind of philosophy, um, going, well, if I avoid God, if I take Him out the equation, let me come up with this philosophy. And they try and work with that, and they try and explain light. We go through history and we find that there are times when they said, well, there must be a God, so they have made an idol. And they started to worship this particular idol. Or they have invented some kind of religion. But when you look at that religion, it's not a religion that asks you to have faith in God. What it is asking you to do is to do a whole lot of things for God to keep Him happy. God doesn't ask us to do any of those things. He asks us to trust in Him and in His nature. And so He's written this into our heart. That you and I would say, I want to have faith in God. Now the nation of Israel were not exercising faith in God. Even the, the very yearning to place it within them that the Gentiles that they were to go and take the message out to, they were prepped and ready. God had created them prepped and ready to receive the message. Somebody just had to go to them and say to them, here's the message. That's all that had to happen. But what were they doing? They weren't trusting that God, what he had said, what he had prepared, what he had done was actually going to work. In their minds, this wasn't going to work. So it was easier to stay back at home and put up a whole lot of tables and do money changing and selling of doves and selling of, of lambs and not actually to trust God Take him at his word. That God who is the God of the universe has actually been outside of the nation of Israel. And he's been into all those other nations and he's prepared, he has prepared everybody to be able to receive or to hear this message. So how does faith work? How does faith in this instance work? I want to demonstrate this in a few moments with an illustration. So those who have asked, just get yourselves ready and prepped and ready. Absence of serious faith is equal to double-mindedness double and instability. James writing, you can go and look for the passage yourselves, but writing chap chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Remember Jesus said to, to these disciples, you're doubting. That's why nothing happens. When you ask, believe and not doubt. In the Greek, it's written as imperative. Don't doubt. Stop doubting. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. That is pretty graphic. Let me demonstrate this. Ellen and um, Rita, come on up here. I've got, um, you know those all sorts biscuits? They've got lemon creams and strawberry whirls and so on. Rita, choose your favorite. Here we go. Ellen, choose your favorite. This one. Uh, hang on. Um, uh, lemon creams. <laughs> no, wait. Hold on. These, these ones are nice. They've got um, no, two. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say to you. I love them all. I'll just give you the whole lot then. Okay. <laughs> just give you the whole lot. <laughs> okay. What's going on here? Rita walks up. I said to, to Rita, Rita, when you're going to come up, just choose your favorite biscuit. She chose the strawberry will. I now have forgiveness problems with her because that's my favorite. 
Alan, I just said to him, come and choose your favorite. Now, in the office, when we have these biscuits, what genuinely does happen is that we actually not too sure which one we want to take. So normally what we do is that we take a strawberry, well, we, we take a lemon cream, we then take one other one. So we usually end up with four biscuits that, that we go off with. You, you can have those, actually, those are my yourself. But. <laughs> but this is a simple example, a, almost a ridiculous example of what double-mindedness looks like. I can't decide. I'm not too sure. And when we apply this to faith, is that, will God hear me? I'm not too sure. Should I pray? I'm not too sure. I don't know if he's listening. Am I even praying to the right God? I'm not too sure. I'm I'm wavering. I'm not too sure. And so what happens is that this waveringness starts to lead us down a road where we that's the end of the day, we just don't make a decision. We're not too sure. Do I believe in God? Do I not believe in God? Do I half believe Him? Do I keep something else just in case God fails? Stanley Jones wrote, wrote this. I love this statement. He wrote this statement in, in one of his books. He says, if you don't make up your mind, then your unmade mind will make you. He goes on, he says, Here's a place where there must be no dallying, for any dallying will be the Trojan horse that will, get, that will get on the inside and open the gates for the enemy. God can do anything for the, for the one who has made up his mind. He can do little or nothing for the double-minded person. You know the best place to get run over? Is in the middle of the road. That's the best place. And if you and I sit on the fence about who God is, you're going to get run over by something. There is a Trojan horse that's going to get into you and it's going to open itself up with some kind of garbage. You cannot serve one or the other. You've got to choose God or or not choose anything. Amen. Thank you. But faith is about single-mindedness. John, when he's writing his letter, he says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. This is the confidence. Hebrews talks about the confidence. Confidence is... Is, is that it's, it's a state of being. It's not an emotion. It's a state of being that I know. This is the state of being that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now let me just stop you for a moment. One of the things I absolutely hate about supper is deciding what to cook. Yes. So to see, what do you what, what what do you like for supper? Oh yeah, let's have this. I go, oh, I don't feel like that. Then then the boys go, oh let's have this. And in our house there, there's seven of us. And you get seven opinions. And it's like, my word, we're gonna have to go and buy the whole pick and pay now. Single-mindedness is, is when I am, I just, that's what we're having. That's it. We've sorted this out in part. Saturday night is burger night. And God help you if it's not. It's burger night. It's predictable. Sunday, after church, Luke will make spaghetti bolognese. Nothing else. Saturday and Sunday are worked out. It's predictable. It's the rest of the week that's a problem. We know we can set our stomachs by what we are going to have. Brilliant. Great. It works for us. I don't mean it work for you, but it works for us in a house of the amount of people we, we have in our house. This is the confidence that 
we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Why? Because you're single-minded. You're not double-minded. Double-minded. Ah, oh, this, ah, oh, that, ah, oh, that. I'm, I'm not too sure. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of Him. Now, it is God's will. It is God's will that, first of all, that you should be forgiven. It's His will. It's His will that you should be loved by Him. It's His will that He will provide for you. It's His will, and I will continue, there are over 10,000 promises in this Bible. And it is God's will that He desires to fulfill them. Because they are, on, he, they, they, they are for His glory. If you're going, I don't know what God's will is, open your Bible and start to read it. And find out what it says. It is God's will. The best thing to do is to pray Scripture. Take Scripture and start praying it. Because you'll find out what God's will is. It's, it's got sing, single-minded faith always seeks to grow and bear fruit, always. You see, when I have faith, I want it always to grow, always to be grown. Just the next slide there, Jordan. I'm always wanting it to grow because I don't want it to stay small. And faith, as we heard right at the beginning of the series, that faith, when it starts off as a mustard seed, the smallest seed that was found in the Middle East, always grows big. It doesn't stay tiny. It always grows. And Jesus is talking about that when we abide in Him, when I am with Him, when I'm walking with Him and Him alone, then He is going to cause fruit to grow within us. Jesus going to the fig tree, expecting there to be fruit, the symbol of the nation of Israel, expecting that there would be fruit. There's no fruit. Well, you know, God expects fruit in season and out of season because there is no, no, there is no time when we lay our faith to one side. We always have faith. So whether it's in season or out of season, there should be the fruit of faith growing. And, and Jesus is saying that if you abide in me, if you're with me, if you're walking with me, if you're doing what I'm doing, you are going to bear fruit. And if you bear fruit, it says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. These are not my words, these are Jesus' words. If you and I abide in him, it will be done. Now, if I had to go through this entire congregation and ask you, those who, when, when you're acting in serious faith and you've taken God at His word and you've prayed and I asked for the testimonies, you will start to tell me, yes, what I asked for, God did. Because it was according to His word. You see, that's faith that pleases God. When, when God can show forth His capabilities. Why? Because it's to His glory. His his glory is his reputation. He wants to show his reputation. Now what happens when I sit with that double-mindedness? What do I need to do when I sit with that double-mindedness? Because if something happens that, that if the other thoughts start to come in, sometimes we're praying and we go, Yo, Lord, this thing is just way too big. I'm not, I'm not too sure whether you can actually do this. Well, the idea is that you go to war against that double-mindedness. Double-minded thoughts must be captured. Why? Because they are deadly. Double-minded thought, when you and I are praying and and we start to think, I'm pretty sure that God can't do that. That's deadly. That is going to kill you. It's going to take you down a road that you don't want to go down. A rabbit hole that, that has got so many different um, tunnels that you're not too sure which tunnel's which. 
So Paul, right into the Corinthians, writes, writes this. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. What is the weapon God has given to us? His word. If you're starting to doubt, pick up your Bible and start to find out who God is, His nature, and you'll realize that He is able to do everything He says that He's able to do. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a thought, a thought pattern that gets into one's head. We can say, oh, well, God's not going to do something. Know his word. What does his word say? And stand upon that word. If God says according to his word that he will do it, know that he will do it. You know, one of the places where, where you start to see people actually living according to the word of God is in the deep third world countries where they don't have the luxury of saying, oh gosh, you know, to sort that problem out, um, I can go to the bank and I can just up on my credit limit. I have a fallback scheme. Where they have no fallback scheme whatsoever, they say, according to the word and the word only. When those guys pray, I feel like I'm not even a Christian. And say, not that we can't afford medical, but there is no doctor within 500 kilometers. What do we do? We pray. And they find healing. We pray and then go to the doctor. You see, there comes a double-mindedness. We pray, and then we go to the financial advisor. We pray and go to somewhere else. We pray and go somewhere else. We pray and go somewhere else. We don't listen, stop and listen and say, Lord, what does it say in your word? What must I do? Listen to God. The strongholds that sit in our minds dictate what our next step's going to be. See, we demolish those arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and bring it, obedience in, it in obedience to Christ. I'm praying about a crisis. And you know, our country at the moment is in a crisis. What is the answer? Pray. Start exercising faith that pleases God. Because I can guarantee you If you go somewhere else, you're going to find a problem because there are human beings there. And wherever there is a human being, you're going to find a problem. You're going to find as much corruption, as much chaos. As I've said to one person who was um, bemoaning about everything in the world, I said, you know what? The best place for you to go is right into the center of Greenland. There's no human being there, and you'll be so happy. But the one thing just watch out for are polar bears. They will eat you. But at least you'll be the only one being heard moaning. Nobody else will have to hear your moaning. Faith that pleases God is taking God at His word and saying, Lord, as you have said, I believe you. I trust you. You see, when Christians like that start to pray for a nation, things happen. Daniel was one man who prayed for his nation and brought an entire empire down and his people came back from exile. Just took one man. We often you find that one person praying causes 
great things to happen. Great things. What I find often is that it's amongst the elderly where you find the greatest prayer warriors. Because very often the elderly have gotten over themselves. They've begun to realize that you know, all the things you can try, and you try them again and again and again, and they don't work. As I say to my kids, that's the boundary. I know you're going to come and test it. And I hope you do just to make sure that it does work. The boundary works. There are certain things in life that don't work. And I find that the elderly have discovered those things several times. And they've learned the lesson. And they've gone, yes, it doesn't work. And now they know that what does work is prayer. And I find amongst our elderly, strong prayer warriors. But why should it be the elderly? Why should the elderly be the only ones who have that privilege? Why can't it be the young people? Why can't it be the youth? Why can't it be the children? The problem is, is that we have become so obsessed with the backup plan that we're not trusting God. So what's the challenge for this, for this week? Just one more thing. Sorry, I forgot here. Jesus, Jesus says to them, he, he, adds, he, he ends off the thing with a real bizarre statement. It says, if you hold anything against anybody, it's almost as though it's just tagged on the end. If you hold anything against anybody, your father's not going to forgive you. And you're going to be li living with this unforgiveness. It looks like it's tagged on at the end, but it's not. You see, unforgiveness takes us into double-mindedness. If you hold unforgiveness towards anybody, that will be the one thing that will sit in center stage in your mind until you've settled it. Sits so in center stage. You go and do an audit of your brain. Somebody who you're angry with, see how much time you take up thinking about them. And if you had access to a nuclear arsenal, how it would help you. The challenge. Am I intentionally single-minded in growing my faith in God? Growing your faith? It's St. Andrews we're offering opportunities to be able to grow. Don't put those to one side and go, I'm too busy. That's part of being double-minded. You are never too busy. Never. Never, ever, ever too busy. It's a lie that comes to us. Single-minded, growing faith in God. Make the intentional decision that if, if you have not yet focused on your faith to make it grow, go and sign up for Alpha. Use that opportunity. Get content to your faith. And then the last one is, who do you need to forgive so as not to be double-minded? Can you just start lining up here <laughs> so I can forgive you? <laughs> Every one of us has somebody we've got to forgive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you ask us to have single-minded, growing faith in you. That's the only thing that will please you. And the thing that gets in the way, that causes us to have double-mindedness is when we don't don't listen to you. We are 
all over the place in our heads. And when unforgiveness comes in, would you help us to break away from that and to grow in our faith, to please you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship God, we're going to bring to Him our tithes and our offerings and encourage you. Speak to the Lord about what He has asked you to give. And then in obedience, give as the Lord has asked you to give. Whether it be what you give today or whether it be giving via EFT, let's give to the Lord.